What's up, everyone? Ben here. Just a quick note before we get into this excellent interview with Grandmaster Danny Gormley. He's a fascinating guy. I finally made a Patreon page. I've had some generous folks in the past offer to donate money to the podcast, and I am finally willing to take your money. So I made a page. You can go to patreon.com slash perpetual chess. That's a mouthful. So I'll also link to this in the show description, and you can go to the show webpage, perpetualchesspod.com, and you'll find your way to the Patreon page. But basically, the suggested donation is $2 a month, and you should only donate if you can afford it. But if you can, and if you'd like to help to support the show, what you would get in return for that donation is access to an exclusive email list where you'll find out the guests before we record. What this will enable you guys to do is we'll set up a voicemail box and an email inbox where you can ask a guest question in advance. So I think this is something special for the people who support the podcast, but I also think it'll make the podcast better overall. I get a lot of emails saying like, hey, Ben, I love the podcast, but you need to talk about this more. Or, hey, Ben, the podcast is pretty good, but you need to talk about that more. So whatever your personal angle is of like ways that it could be better, guess what? You can wield your $24 annual donation like a hammer and direct the podcast in that direction with your questions, get your name on the air, get your voice on the air if you want, stuff like that. So you don't have to, but if you're interested in that, you are welcome to. That's it for my spiel. You guys need to get to the main event. Danny Gormley is um, really interesting. I think this is a fun interview. So please sit back and enjoy, and I will be in touch soon. Thanks, everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello again, everyone. Here I am with uh, English Grandmaster Danny Gormley. He's an author, a chess player, a soul bearer. Danny, thanks for coming on Perpetual Chess. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem, Ben, mate. Yeah, no problem. So I've uh, uh, regular listeners will know I've got a long list of books I want to read, and I finally got to read yours, and I'm excited to have you on. And I'm going to want to talk about your most recent book. You've written a few uh, yep. in a few minutes, but you also just wrote a blog coming off of the uh, British Championship for. Um, for Simon Williams' is uh, Ginger GM site, and I thought maybe we could start things off with you giving a little recap for our listeners of how your experience was at the British Championship. Yeah, I mean, it was quite positive in a way because basically, you know, normally when I play a chess tournament, I, you know, turn up and I sort of like go drinking a lot. I mean, you know, my history of playing in the British Championships is that... Um, you know, I've tended to sort of like gone drinking pretty much every night. I think I think the the previous British was in Borba for 2016, and I've generally just sort of like I remember going out a pub pretty much every night, and I think that catches up with you by the end of the tournament because you're just drinking like heavily. And but this tour was different because basically I looked up the hotel. Yeah, you know, I was really lazy. I'm like really lazy, so I I, I didn't really. Uh, booked the hotel to the last minute. So I looked up the hotel, and I, I sort of like the prices of the hotel in Land did, though, where we were playing. And there was something like 800 or 900 for the uh, 900 pounds for the for the 10 days, basically. And I thought, you know, that's just too much. So I got in contact with uh, a friend of mine called Steve Rush, who used to be a snooker professional. And he said, you know, come and stay uh, with me in uh, Prestatin, which is about 40 minutes away. So I went for that instead. And as a consequence, I played a lot better because I wasn't sort of going out drinking. And I do remember there was one night where uh, there's quite a few uh, players who'd lost. And it was sort of um, uh, me, Simon Williams. Uh, So I won my game. So I was on three out of three. Cy Williams, Lawrence Trent both lost that round. So we all went down to the pub um, in Landindo. And then basically they sort of stayed on. And I sort of went back early. But I thought if, 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 if I had been staying there, I would have stayed on for longer, you know, and I would have got more and more drunk. And then as a consequence, I would have had a less chance in, in the next round, basically. 
Yeah, sometimes um, you can. It can be a blessing in disguise if you uh, have to deal with deal with a commute or something like that. Um, you you yeah. pin, you and we've had Simon Williams on, who obviously is uh, quite open about his enthusiasm for for uh, sharing a pint with with people like yourself. Um, yeah, I, I get the sense that the British chess players in particular uh, like to to go out and unwind with a drink a little bit more than uh people from other places have you found that to be true oh yeah i mean for example when i played uh european championships uh team championships which is in Gothenburg, which is in 2005 and i went there and it was like a hotel full of chess players so you saw hundreds of chess players you know so you get a women's event and you get a men's event and um you know, literally, like hardly anyone turned up at a bar, and really, the only people who turn up at a bar were people like Ivan Sokolov, and obviously, like the other English players, people like Nick, myself and Nick Perr. And it just amazed me. You know, if, if that tournament was in, in in England, the bar would just be full of chess players. But yeah, I do think it makes a difference. You know, like if if you're drinking a lot, then uh, over the course of a tournament. You know, I mean, for example, like the Foreign CL, which is like the uh, team event in England. Basically, what tends to happen on the Saturday night is, you know, everyone gets absolutely lathered at the bar, you know, staying up till three, four in the morning and, and on a Friday night as well. And those players tend to lose the next day. You know, so there's a kind of like an invisible effect. You yeah, don't nat natural selection at work. <laughs> yeah, I mean. You know, like, so if you want to be committed and you want to do well, and it was amazing to me, like, when I played the British this year, the effect that made, you know, I just felt so much sharper at the board because I wasn't drinking so much. Okay, I'd have, like, one or two pints after the game maybe, but, you know, when you're having, like, four or five, you know, it, it just wears on you and you become very lethargic, especially by the end of the tournament. And I also think it raises your anxiety levels, you know, as well, drinking. Yeah, I've noticed that too, and I know you and I are at, about the same age and we'll talk more about your book in a bit but you mentioned in your book that in particular as you get older it becomes you know a little bit harder to recover and i think you you feel it a little more um as the competition goes on yeah absolutely i think you have less energy and you you know there's so many like you know when i was playing sort of 15 20 years ago there didn't seem to be the same amount of junior players as there are now you know there seems to be a lot more junior players so you're fighting against kids who are like 20 years younger than you and, you know, like more, you know, 25 years younger. And they've got like, you know, unbelievable energy levels. So you've got to kind of compete with that, really. And if, you, if you're just get, going boozing, but even to sort of like try and beat weaker players, you know, you need that little edge. You need to have that energy. I always think like if they had a sort of like a tournament in my hometown, I'd probably do very well because... If I was playing under normal circumstances where, you know, I wasn't really going out drinking, I'd do very well because basically um, you, you've got that edge, you've got that sort of mental energy. But, yeah, w w when I tend to go away to tournaments now, it tends to be like you're socialising. Yeah, I don't know many people where I live. So, like, when I go away to tournaments, you know, I tend to sort of, like, go out socialise a lot because, you know, I don't really socialise when I'm at home so much. So... Well, that's an excuse, really. I'll just like having a drink, basically. <laughs> well, no, I mean, but it makes sense. I mean, these are these people are your your work compatriots. I mean, you you know, it's, yeah, it's exactly. a very very unique profession that that you have. So, um, but if you look at the people who are doing well, like by the end of the tournament, they tend to be the people who haven't really gone out drinking. You know, uh, so people like David Howe, he won't really go out drinking during the tournament, but he'll come out in the final night, which is very sensible. Gawain Jones, uh, he used to be. You know, used to drink a fair bit, but I didn't really see him down the pub like the whole tournament. Um, uh, basically, yeah, Luke McShane didn't really see him. So, yeah, the people who tend to do well. I mean, for example, last year, Mickey Adams, uh, he came out on the rest night and he came out on the final night, but every other night didn't really come out drinking. And again, he won the tournament. So, you, yeah. you know, if you want to do well, then obviously you have, but I just find, you know, you finish your game. And then you go back to the hotel room. It's like six o'clock in the evening, especially if you had a bad result. You know, you want to go down the pub. So you go down the pub, you have a few drinks. And then you just, well, you know, you just carry on from there. And then obviously over the course of the tournament, 
uh, that has a negative effect. I mean, you look at Simon, for example. I mean, you know, as an example, he would do significantly better if he didn't drink. But at the same time, you know, drinking is part of what he is. He enjoys drinking. He likes he likes to socialize. It's part of his brand, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's an ever-growing brand, it seems to be. <laughs> yeah, it is, which is good for him. He's a great guy. But uh, Yeah, no, he is. I mean, I've known Simon for years, yeah. you know, and, like, a long time, since he probably uh, 20 years, probably known Simon for, and um, maybe not, not that long. I've known him since about nine, yeah, so 996 I've known him, so over 20 years. And, uh, you know, we've had a few falling outs over the years, but generally got really well, you know, he's a great guy, got a great sense of humor. And, you know, he's a very easy person to socialize with, just, you know, very sort of laid back. So, yeah. Yeah, and it comes across in his uh, broadcasting and YouTube videos. Yeah, and stuff. yeah he's not really fake, you know, yeah. that's how he is, you know, so. Um, okay, well, well, we'll definitely want to get back to the tales of drinking and like the sort of, um, yeah. you know, the philosophical conversation about the effects on the chest. But I, I want you to tell our listeners also about the actual chest. So you started 3-0, yeah. and, oh, and, and what happened from there? Well, I mean, in round four, I was playing Gawain, and then... Um, so you know, just for like, listeners, I think most will know, but that's Grandmaster Gawain Jones, who's what, uh, England number three? Or number two? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Gawain, he's, uh, he's high up. I mean, I don't know what his actual ranking is in England. It might be lower than that, but he's like, like you know, higher up. I mean, he's obviously up there with a... I mean, the only one you would say who's definitely stronger than him is, is Mickey Adams. Other right. than that, he's as good as anyone else. Uh, but he plays a lot um, abroad as well. I mean, he's won a lot of big tournaments recently. I mean, he won Vikans AB. Yeah. So now he's playing in Vikans AA. He won a Dubai Open, I think. Um, so, you know, he's used to winning big tournaments. So, yeah, I played him in round four. But the thing is, I wasn't as worried playing that game because, I mean, against David Howe, I got a bad record. Uh, against Luke McShane, although I haven't played him much for years, I've got a bad record. Um, you know, but against Gawain, I've actually got a reasonable record. So, you know, I was going in the game reasonably confident. Okay, so before before you continue with with the game, I, I did you mentioned that in your write up for Ginger GM too, and I just wanted to touch on that. Like, how important is your record? Like, does does is it really a question of styles matching up, or is it more like a, a psychological, um, just having more confidence against? I think uh, it's a combination, really, because I think you know when, when yeah, it's definitely styles. I feel comfortable playing against his style, whereas I think with people that sort of like David Howell or. Luke Shay was slightly different. Like David Howard, very good strategical player. So he doesn't really give you a chance to play. Whereas I think with Gawain, he gives you a chance to play chess. Okay. So um, but also, like, Gawain is very tactical. And that's like a strength for mine. That it is, is or is not? Sorry. It, it is a strength okay. for mine. You know, so I like kind of, you know, you know, I could calculate quite well. So um, strategic chess is probably a weakness. As for the psychological aspect of it, uh, I mean, basically, um, yeah, I think it, it does have an effect. You know, if you, once you start losing to somebody, uh, it, you know, it has an effect because if you if you suddenly get a bad position against them, it's very easy to then start thinking, oh, here we go again. And you know, to actually fight against that is not easy. So yeah, there is a there is a sense where you can get. A, you know, I know people don't admit to it. There are, you know, a sense where you get a sort of psychological weakness against someone. Definitely, yeah. Okay. So anyway, getting back to the game, how how did the game go? Well, I mean, basically got into some sort of ending. So he played like the English against me, which I was kind of surprised because I was expecting him to play like E4. So he played the English and then we got into some sort of ending. And, um, you know, I was kind of optimistic because suddenly I realized his, his pawns on the king side weren't going anywhere. So we kind of had a weird opposite color bishops ending. We both got a knight each. Uh, but he's got like four against two on the king side, and I've got uh, basically two connected pass pawns on the queen side. But I'm a lot better because I'm, I'm controlling his pawns. But then we got to a point where um, basically, yeah, there were a couple of moments in the game where I probably could have won. Because at one moment he played h4, and then, you know, when I was thinking about that position earlier, 
I was actually thinking I'm going to I'm going to play Bishop E1. If he goes H4, I've got Bishop E1. So H4 is no good. So you calculate. You know when you calculate on the board, you think right that move's no good because I can go Bishop E1. But then when I started thinking about it, I sort of started worrying myself out of it. I wasn't really calculating very well. And um, you know I filmed a, a video course recently, and I was talking about you know the value of basically trusting your instincts. Mm-hmm. So when you got like. Uh, you know what you, what your gut instinct is you should often follow it you know obviously you need to calculate as well and check that that instinct is right but you know i do think that a lot of players that underestimate the value of intuition and that was kind of like a bit annoying for me because i basically went against my gut instincts and there are definitely chances to win and i was a little bit annoyed i didn't win in the end and i didn't realize obviously at the time uh what an important game it was because obviously he went on to win the tournament and but yeah, I think in chess you need to trust your intuition. Basically, I, I, I didn't trust my intuition in that end game, and it cost me to, probably to win. But I think there was also one moment, yeah, when I could have got h five, and I had about sort of sixteen minutes left, and I really should have, you know, plus, plus you get increment as well, so I had plenty of time left. So I really should have invested that time, and I think that's a lot. Of, that's been a long term weakness of mine, which has been to move too quickly at certain moments. Uh, like key moments in the game because obviously like you kind of feel like this is, this is a key moment so you're getting nervous you know you feel like I'm on the verge of beating a 2650 player with black one of the top seeds so you get a little bit nervous and that's the, the point to slow down slow yourself down basically yeah that makes sense okay so a little bit of a disappointment there but three and a half out of four um, having drawn one of the top seeds with black I uh, guessing you still had some you know in good shape at that point so what happened from there well the next round drew with john ems and um i was a bit really i i misplayed the opening i just i was really annoyed with that game actually because i felt like you know no disrespect to john but i felt like i was a good chance to win and and kick on and uh just played a really bad game and actually i was in trouble and he probably should have beat me um it's quite funny, actually, because this is one of the things I wrote about in my blog, was after we finished the game, we went down to the analysis area. So there's like a big room downstairs, um, which is like a big open room. You've got a cafeteria in there as well. There's lots of people milling around, lots of juniors and, and so on. And we're trying to find a set, and there's lots of people analysing, and, you know, there's no set. And I, I basically made the point that, you know, we're playing on the demo boards in the British Championships, you know, we're playing on like the fourth board or whatever it is. And, um, you know, you haven't got like a set to analyze with. It's totally ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's got to be a little frustrating for sure. Well, I mean, can you imagine if you're playing in the US Championships or whatever and they can't find a set, you know, for one of the top games? It just seems totally ridiculous. But, yeah, but yeah I mean, after that, I... Uh, Sorry, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah, continue with what was. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah. I mean, the U.S. is lucky right now. You know, obviously, yeah. having having Rex Sinfeld sponsor things has made a, everything high class. But we've the U.S. championship has had some lean years as well. So um, I think these well, things I, go in Yeah, I mean, I do remember stories about how, because I played some tournament in Bermuda, and they were talking about how you had to bring the uh, set, to, your own set to the uh, tournament or stuff like that. And I thought, if you play in America, there's some stories about you have to bring your own set. set yeah, or this is true. I mean, I don't know like how high up that goes, but that's generally how that's generally the protocol. Yeah, it seems a bit ridiculous, to be honest. But yeah. um, you should provide the own equipment. But yeah, yeah. I mean, after that, basically, um, well, I think the, the best game... For for me was the game against James Adair because I think that was about round six or I think that was about round six and uh, yeah I beat him and that was a good game actually and he was like one of my main rivals for the for the rating prize as well so you, you start thinking about the rating prize uh, which is <laughs> um, you know I said, I said actually before you know uh, I said really you shouldn't even think about a rating prize because you should be thinking about winning the tour, winning one of the main prizes, uh, but yeah, it was sort of like playing on my mind a little bit because it's quite a lot of money. It was like two grand first, you know. Right. 
I mean, James is a really nice guy, but I, you know, I played a decent game there, and I turned down the draws at one point as well, which is which is rare for me. You know, I'm normally normally grabbing draws like whenever I can find them. You know. Yeah, but, I, know, I know you've mentioned that in your writing a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think there's always a danger, you know, with chess that you can you can become quite cowardly, and uh, um, because there's, there's always this sort of like fear of of losing. Yeah. Yeah. And for the. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say for the listeners who who aren't as familiar with Danny's writing, he's written with with great honesty about a topic that we haven't covered that much, which is just like Danny. Danny's trying to make a living um, and the prize money is important. So it's it's difficult to ignore. Would you say that's a, a fair characterization? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So if you're in a situation where you're in the last round and I mean, I, I'll give you an example, like I think it was two years ago, at the British Championships in Warwick. And really, I should, that was a British Championships I should have won because I was in a position to win it. But then come to the end of the tournament, I started taking draws because I was thinking I want to lock in a prize. And in the last round, I'm in a situation where if I lose, I'm going to get like 50 quid. If I win... I'm going to get like maybe six grand or something because I'll come equal first and get into a playoff. And, and if I draw, uh, well, as it turned out, I drew. So I got about 1,600 quid, uh, maybe slightly less than that. Actually, I can't remember, but um, actually it might have been slightly more. But anyway, the point, the point is that you're in that kind of cutthroat situation. And... You know, it's very easy for people on the side. I say, "Oh, why did you take a draw there? You know, why didn't you play on?" But when you've got no money, and you think, "Well, you know, I can't afford to eat for the next month if I if I if I lose this game," you know, it's it's a totally different situation, really, isn't it? You know. Yeah, that really brings it home. That's uh, that's a tough situation. So, uh, what was the what was the nature of the game? You might have had a slight edge. You think? Well, I guess James, yeah. I mean, he prepared really well. I mean, he's really got really good preparation. And, I mean, I basically filmed this DVD on the English for chess base, on the English attack, sorry, in right. the Sicilian, which is where you go like F3 and Bishop E3 against the Nidorf. Mm-hmm. And but he played out his white against me, and I, I couldn't remember the theory that well. I mean, he knew the theory better than me, even though I'd done this DVD basically uh, you know that's the problem like when when you like write a book or do a dvd you, you just forget it like a few months later anyway you forget what you wrote so but yeah i mean basically we've got some sort of like unclear position and then you know it was quite interesting actually when i was analyzing it afterwards because his king was quite open but the, the computer still thinks that why it's better because the computer could just defend against any kind of attack but right, for a huge yeah. like yeah, exactly. But I think for human players, very, very difficult to defend that position, you know, basically. So from the practical point of view, and um, yeah, I felt like I was motivated to win that game because I felt like, you know, he's like the up and coming player and I'm kind of like down in the doldrums. I want to prove that I can still play with these people. And, um, you know, and then, and then basically after that, I then drew the next round against Luke McShane. I kind of um, said to people, actually, I think he kind of made a slight psychological error, really, because he beat David Howe with White, which was a good game. And then when he the next two rounds, he's playing me and he's playing John Ems, who are both like 200 points lower rated than him. He should, I think he should have played something other than the Berlin. I mean, he played the Berlin defense against me. I mean, right. Yeah, and then he had White in the last round, right? Yeah, but I think that's slightly different because he's white against Gawain. He's also a very strong player, but he's playing against me and, and John, right, who are right. significantly weaker than him. So why is he not playing um, like the Sicilian or just some kind of sharper defense to try and beat us? And then he doesn't need to worry about the playoff. Yeah, and as you, as a, a lot of listeners will know, and you mentioned in your book, uh, Luke McShane, we presume, is not um, not playing for rent money. <laughs> pretty successful no, no, guy I, mean, I know he used to work for goldman sachs right. and i mean i don't i mean i think he's actually a professional chess player somebody told me he's a professional chess player oh okay. which surprised me i mean i thought he worked as a trader right somebody said that he's actually does professional chess but he just doesn't play many tournaments 
I mean, I don't know. I don't really know him socially anyway, so it's difficult to say. But um, yeah, I mean, I used to know him a lot when he was younger. You know, we used to be quite good friends when we were younger, but we don't really speak that much. I mean, like away from chess. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's like a really, really talented player. I mean, he should have. I think I first played him when I was twelve, and he was four. <laughs> the uh, chess and bridge center in Clapham. So I used to bunk off school to go there, and uh, basically uh, I'd sort of turn out my school uniform. There was a guy there called Julian Simpole who ran that. He who ran that, and it was basically it was above a Mecca Bingo Hall in in Clapham Junction. So Luke McShane is from Clapham. And they, he turned up one day and he said, oh, why don't you play against this kid? So I played him and I beat him quite easily. And obviously I didn't realise at the time he was going to be like, you know, going to be as good as he was. But they were so even then they were saying, oh, he's going to be very, very good. So, yeah, he's probably one of the most talented players we've ever seen like in the UK, without a doubt, you know. Yeah. Okay. And just to wrap up the tournament. So did you end up uh, winning the class prize you mentioned or no? Well, no, because what happened was um, basically uh, I think John Ems won it because I lost the last. I mean, the ridiculous thing was going into the last round. I mean, I was kind of worried. I think the problem was a lot. There was no rest day. So, you know, which I think is very, very difficult. You know, you have no rest day, so you get more and more tired. And... Um, I mean, basically, the, the, the round eight, I was playing against Craig Hanley. And because I was commuted by trade, I, I made the mistake of waiting a little bit too long to get the trade. And on the Saturdays, the trades are a lot, sl- a lot slower. So basically, the trade was delayed. And I was riding to the ball because, you know, I was about 20 minutes late for the game. And I thought, I wasn't sure what the default time was, whether it was half an hour or an hour or whatever. But I thought, if, if I don't turn up on the board... And I default, I can't even win a prize. Right. You know, I can't win a rate, basically, because you have to play all, all the games to win a rate prize. If you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Now, if I was in Craig's situation and my opponent didn't turn up, then he could still win a prize because it's not his fault. He right. could still win a rate prize. But it's in my hands and I've basically not turned up. So, therefore, I wouldn't be eligible for a rate prize. So I was really panicking. Um. So then I played Craig, and that was probably like my worst game because I was like really um, uh, kind of because it sets you on edge when you're worrying before the game. It kind of sets you on edge, so you're not really relaxed at the board. So I played quite badly, and I was lucky to get a draw. And then um, in the last round, I'm playing Ami Gartsy, who's quite a talented player from Birmingham. He doesn't play professionally, but he's been like close to GM strength for like many years now. And um, if not GM strength, basically. And I've got a good position. You know, I thought, I thought you know, going into the game, it's a good pairing because I, 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 why, you know, when I was in a situation before where if I win, if I, win I get into a playoff, I've been black. This time I was white. So the game was, you know, in my control. And I also thought this is a player I've done well against in the past. You know, I've never lost to him in a proper game. And, uh, but the problem was, uh, Ben, you know, because of this rating price, you know, I was I was already, I mean, in one way it was good because I was already guaranteed a prize. So I was already already guaranteed to win, um, I, you know, I worked out I was already guaranteed to win a certain amount of money. But the night before I was like working out, um, you know, how much am I going to win? Uh, if I lose to Gartsy, how much am I going to win? Am I still going to get a better rate performance than him? And, you know, that's ridiculous to, to think like that because it's just so negative. Right. You know, I shouldn't be thinking, oh, you know, if I lose to Gartsy, uh, you know, do, do I still get, do I still get the, the, you know, basically a rating prize or what, whatever. And, um, yeah, basically, uh, I just played this ridiculous, I mean, we got to a position where, it was, you know, it was unclear. But he was kind of like, you know, he was getting nervous. And I think he kind of lured me into a trap in a way. You know, it was almost like a, like his body language was kind of like, you know, almost on purpose to kind of make himself look weak, and then uh, I could pounce. And um, yeah, I kind of got like a little bit of an ego battle. Really, I got into a little bit of an ego battle, and there was a position where 
Um, I could just play a normal move like Knight F3. But instead of which, I played probably the most stupid move I've ever played in my entire life. Bishop takes B5. <laughs> which is... Yeah, and the problem was, I mean, I just miscalculated. I just forgot that when he goes... Uh, he takes back on b5, I go knight takes b5, he goes queen c6, I go knight takes d6, he doesn't have to move the rook, he can take on e4. So I've got like 50 minutes to work this out, you know, but obviously there's, there's kind of like this invisible pressure of, you know, you think if you win you get into the playoff, and that must have affected me. Okay, so, so you would have tied for first if you won? I mean, prior, like, going into the playoff? Or, yeah, yeah. Basically, um, yeah, I would have tied. I mean, going into the last round, I thought, well, if uh, John Ems wins, I can't catch him. But he's black against David Howe, so I didn't think he was going to win. But I thought David would win that game. Yeah, he, he was half point ahead of the field, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and well, no, him and uh, uh, Luke maybe. No, he was tied, I think, with Luke McShane and Gawain okay. Jones. And I thought if if Gawain Jones if Gawain Jones or Luke McShane win, then they're going to have more points as well. So I can't catch them. But I thought, well, it's unlikely that that, that game will be decisive because they'll both be worried. They'll both be conscious of the fact if they lose, it's costing them a lot of money. And if they if they draw, then they're guaranteed to play off anyway. So they're guaranteed a shot at the title, or whatever. And how so, did uh, how did the prize money work with like going to the playoff versus like um, mm. winning it outright, like? Um, yeah. Like, do they, is the prize money like, say, three people go to the playoff? Do yeah. they like split up the prize money and as as if you all three tied for first, and then just someone gets the title, or are you playing for money within the playoff, like playing for the top three places? Do you know what well, I mean? Well, obviously, because I didn't get in the playoff, it's hard for me to say. But, right. <laughs> well, you were cl- you were closer than I was, so. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I spoke to Craig Hanley, who did get in the playoff. Actually, well, he did really well. But he, I think, he pretty much said you get you get pretty much the same money. Okay, and you're, you're just playing for. Yeah, I mean uh, that's what I think it should be. Yeah, I mean I think I think if you won it outright, it's like ten thousand. But uh, the thing is, even though the difference, I think I think because they shared, they got like I think there were four people in the playoff. Because they shared, they got like four thousand each, or four thousand and something each. But the thing is, I think the difference between getting, say, 4,000 and, say, if you lost and you get, like, almost nothing and getting 4,000, 10,000, I think it's actually, like, it's, it's, it's a bigger difference in a way. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Because, you know, you want to go away from there with a decent prize, you know, basically. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I can understand why they, were, why they were happy. That's why I thought, you know, going to that game, I thought, well, they'll draw – and they did. And I thought, well, John Ems probably won't beat David Howe, and he didn't. So, you know, basically I knew at the back of my mind that if I win this game, and obviously Garth has got less points, so it's, it's less pressure for him in a way. Right. But, yeah, I mean, I can't make any excuses. I mean, basically I just played this moronic move at one point. I was really, really angry with myself when I played it because I thought I played the whole tournament, and I've not come close to losing, really. And I've played really solid chess, played really well, and to just throw it all away like that, I was just really, 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 really angry with myself, basically. Yeah, I mean, chess is it's just so unforgiving. <laughs> well, it's just, it's just like, um, I mean, I do think I kind of hit the wall, like, mentally, because, you know, not having that rest day, I mean, if you look at the guys who got into the playoff, they're all, like, younger guys. Right. You know, right. so I think like the older guys like me, John Ems, we all kind of faded at the end. You know, we kind of ran out of energy basically. So, um, yeah, I mean, the weird thing is going into that game, I felt really good. You know, I felt like the, the morning of the game, I felt really good. So maybe it was partly overconfidence as well. Maybe I was just like overconfident that, um, you know, I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going to mess it up this time because I do have a history of messing up games in the last round, basically. Right. Well, I mean, it's obviously this is small consolation, but as far as I'm concerned, it's still quite a showing. And, you know, obviously it'll be a long wait for you waiting for next year, but at least you have, you know, something to build on, probably a, a bit of confidence booster. Yeah, the thing is, Ben, I mean, I feel like, you know, it kind of, 
I feel now that I kind of like got interested in chess again and inspired to play chess. And, and the frustrating thing for me over the last few years has not been able to play as much as I would have liked. Uh, and that's partly due to not like not liking flying, you know, being right. scared of flying. You know, and then you look at tournaments that people are playing. I mean, like uh, a friend of mine, Lawrence Trent, he's playing in Barcelona at the moment. Um... Uh, another friend of mine, Keith Arkell, he's playing in Qatar, winning loads of money over there. Hmm. And you think, well, I could be playing those tournaments. And it's kind of frustrating, it's just, you know, because I feel like, like, you know, I could do a lot better. I feel like I'm a lot much stronger than a 2460 player. But I need to play regularly to prove that, you know. Yeah. And it's very hard when you stop, start, stop, start all the time and you don't play for three months, then you play and, you, and you're rusty. You never really get any momentum going. You never get any form going, you know? Yeah. And I know you've written a bit about your fear of flying. I gather you've, like, tried meds and stuff like that. Like, is have you um, tried anything to help out with that? Well, I mean, I went on a... Um, I mean, I've tried lots of things. I mean, I tried a hypnotist. I went to a hypnotist wow. when I was in London. And the guys started going... Um, I mean, he'd been on TV shows. It was like like, photographs of him in his in his sort of like office or whatever it was and there was sort of like uh, where he's doing sort of hypnotist sessions so I sat down and he started saying oh you're getting sort of uh, uh, you, you, you're starting to get sleepy I was like well I'm not really huh. you know and um, and then he said well you're one of these people who are very unique that don't allow you, your minds to be controlled by someone else but you're still going to have to pay me 40 quid for the session. <laughs> That's great. I was like, oh, thank, thanks for that. Oh, great. Yeah, right. so special. But um, <laughs> even though you couldn't hypnotize me, I still have to pay you. Great. Right. But, yeah, no, I went on this Flying Without Fear course. I mean, the problem is with all this stuff, just it doesn't prepare you for that moment when you're kind of like in the plane and there's a lot of turbulence and you feel like you're out of control of the situation. I mean... You know, I was reading this the other day that, you know, fear of flying is one of the worst fears you can have because, you know, with other fears, you can expose yourself to that fear. Right. Like if, you, if you've got a fear of, like, spiders or whatever, you see spiders on a regular basis. But with fear of flying, um, you know, you, you, you're not you're not going to take flights regularly. So it's hard to kind of, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and you can't really fake it. Like yeah, you can't really fake it. Um, I mean, I think it's linked to a fear of heights, really, because I don't really like heights. Uh, you know, the other day I went up this hill, and uh, I sort of like started walking around. I sort of almost felt like I was on the verge of having a panic attack. And even later on, we were getting the bus. I was getting the bus back uh, to where I live. So it's basically like this place called Rothbury, which is quite close to... Uh, uh, quite close to where I live. It's quite a nice area, but it's not very high up. It's not like the Himalayas or anything like that. You know, I mean, it's not even like the Lake Districts. Like Northumberland is quite flat. Uh, but it's still, you know, it's quite high hills or whatever. And I was sort of like, when we get in the bus back, I was even then I was sort of freaking out because it's going up this quite sort of steep hill. And, uh, you know, I thought, well, yeah, it's not really very good, really, because you still uh, still got that sort of anxiety, basically underneath it all right and of course statistically it's more dangerous than flying i'm sure <laughs> Small. oh absolutely yeah i mean uh yeah i mean driving is a lot worse than uh i mean flying is one of the safest forms of travel i know that but it's just like when you're actually in that situation uh your kind of phobia overwhelms your kind of reasoning if you know what i mean yeah for sure and uh, you know everyone has had those moments so i'm sure yours is like an uh, like those moments of fear on a plane so i'm sure if yours is an amplified version then we we can imagine yeah. what that feels like and it wouldn't be fun yeah but i think to be a chess player you need to be able to fly because there's not enough tournaments in the uk i mean there are not many good tournaments in the uk at all really and obviously, you can you can you can get trains to places like France and Germany and Holland, um, but it's it's still it's, it's it's a lot of traveling, you know. And I live in the north of England, so I have to get down if I do that kind of route. I have to get down to London first, which still takes like four or five hours just to get there. 
So, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot. And then you're spending a lot of money as well. You know, if you're getting a train to say, yeah, if you're getting a train to say like, I know Paris or whatever, it's, it's going to cost like two, 300 quid. Uh, so it's, it's quite expensive as well, you know? So yeah, I think you need to fly basically. Yeah. Okay. And last amateur doctor question. Have you tried sleep pills? Well, I think one of the problems I have is that um, uh, basically uh, it's just not the anxiety um, during the flight. It's actually the build up to it. It's like I've, right. I've been in situations where the night before I can't sleep. And then when I've actually, you know, the, uh, I've not gone to the airport even because I'm so anxious. And yeah, you get, I'll get worked up like more and more thinking about the flight like days and weeks. And then, because, uh, yeah, I remember reading about Dennis Bergkamp and he said, you know, he stopped flying because, you know, he could get on the flight, but it's just like the anxiety when he's there, you know, thinking, worrying about the flight back, and then he said it's not worth it, you know? Yeah. Okay, well, well, Danny, I want to get into your book a little bit. I mean, I know you've written a couple, but the one that, that's been on my radar and I just, just got to read and really enjoy it is called uh, Insanity, Passion, and Addiction, A Year Inside the Chess World. Yeah. And, and I was excited to read this because it's like – it's kind of a genre for I, – I know you're a sports fan. I'm a sports fan yeah. too. And it's kind of like a little subgenre of book where people, you know – basically give the behind the scenes look of what life is like and i i really enjoyed reading your perspective i mean you you really bear your soul in this book so um how did uh how did this project come to existence danny how did you uh come decide to write this book well i was playing this tournament in uh scotland uh, a lot of blitz tournament and um bases guy there called arcady nidic who's like a Obviously, yeah, like a very famous player. general yeah. master. Well, now, now he represents Azerbaijan, actually. I think he originally was from Latvia, actually. But he was there as like an invited player. And he said to me, oh, I really like your blog, you know. And um, would you be interested in possibly writing a book, you know? Actually, I think maybe it was Natalie Poganina who, who suggested the idea of a book. Yeah, I think that's what you said in the book, for what it's worth. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, N Natalia Poganina from Russia, because she also put some of her stuff up on her, uh, some some of my stuff up on her website, and she said, you know, it was reasonably popular. And I remember when I wrote this blog, before it got a load, of, it got a load of hits. You know, people really really enjoyed it. So I thought, rather than writing a book where the problem is, if you're writing a book about chess, if you're just writing a book about the opening or whatever, you can't really be creative. You know, you can put little stuff in there. But if you're writing a book about what it's like to be a chess player, then you can talk about anything you like, basically. You know, you can be more creative. And I, that's, that's why I enjoy the idea of that book, basically, yeah. Yeah, and again, I, I, just for the people who haven't read it, I mean, it talks about a lot of... Obviously, you, you annotate some games and talk about the experience of playing in tournaments, but you also talk about, mm -hmm. you know, relation like women... Uh, Drugs, yeah. alcohol, sports psychology, lots of lots of different topics to get into. So it's um, I would say yeah. it's rated rated R. I would say not rated maybe PG thirteen, but anyway, it's not for kids. But uh, most of our listeners are adults, oh, and I think they'll enjoy it. Well, they need to know what it's like. <laughs> yeah, they'll find out sooner or later. But yeah, <laughs> um, I don't want to get any angry letter from parents. So oh no no oh yeah, but I don't worry about stuff like that. I, I, <laughs> yeah, and you also, I don't care who I fed. You know. <laughs> yeah, that's what makes the book uh, compelling. Is I mean, you're you're so open uh, within the book. I mean, in terms of your financial situation, like I said, uh, relationships with women. So was this like. Was this hard for you? Like, did you have to force yourself to bear your soul or did it just come naturally to you? Oh, probably quite an honest person in general. But, I mean, generally speaking, you know, if you just live in England for, for long enough, you, you experience these weird situations. I mean, just to give an example, last night I went out drinking in Newcastle. So I met up with a friend of mine, David Eggleston, who also plays chess. And uh, we, were, we were sitting down at this bar. We were sitting outside. This is probably about eight o'clock in the evening. And then all of a sudden this massive brawl started and these people started flying everywhere. And, you know, um, this guy just flew, flew into this shop and uh, it was, yeah, people were like cheering them on. And 
Yeah, well, well, this is like a typical night out in Newcastle. And then uh, later on, I'm at the train station and there's this guy there and this girl in a miniskirt goes over to chat to, to him and he just gets really angry, just pushes her violently wow. to the floor. And then he storms past me and I'm thinking, um, I was almost tempted to say, uh, oh, uh, you know, uh, do, you, do you fancy having to go with me, mate? You know, rather than, you know, he's a tough guy, but he looked quite big and uh, I think <laughs> uh, <laughs> he probably would have just knocked me out. So uh, pro- probably wise I didn't say that. But, um, yeah, I think even just, yeah, just normally, if you live in England, you get these sort of like quite amusing situations. Well, but it wasn't particularly amusing. It was quite disturbing, actually, but uh, all the time, basically, yeah. So... Yeah, I think if you just talk talk about it, yeah, I think it's I think it's something interesting to talk about. I think people are they don't want to read about somebody just sitting at home spending six hours looking at chess space, right? You know, they want to they want to say what are the actual human stories behind you know what is it like? What, what's Mark Hebden like as a person? What's Simon Williams like as a person? People want to know. These, you know, that's why if you go on, online and, and you watch, I mean, I know computers are a lot stronger than, 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 than us at chess now. But if you go online and you watch um, uh, computer matches, you go on Chess Bomb, you know, and sometimes they'll broadcast computer matches, you know, even live. Uh, you get very rarely get any comments on the games. But obviously, you know, they're probably much higher quality than, say, Magnus Carlsen versus Nakamura, where you'll get, like, thousands of comments on the games so people are interested in the personality basically of what it's like to be a chess player yeah for sure and you know we enjoy the little glimpses into some of the people you mentioned some of the prominent english chess players besides yourself but sure. i mean you also sort of you know you you deal openly with your own struggle of sort of the push and pull of being like a, trying to make it as a professional chess player at your level yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think I think the money side for me has been the biggest problem because um, you know it's just it's just very difficult to make a living as being a chess player. And to be honest with you, Ben, you know I mean I left school when I was fifteen. I didn't get any qualifications. I didn't even get any GCSEs. Uh, so already I'm sort of like behind the eight ball, and uh, I sort of like drifted into chess. I wasn't intending to do chess as as a career. Uh, but I sort of drifted into it because it was something, you know, I was good at, you know, I was talented at chess. So I thought, you know, I might as well give it a go. And then I started doing well. So I thought, you know, I'll carry on. And then became an IM. And, you know, when I was, I was thinking about this the other day and I was thinking, well, you know, when I was younger, actually, I was getting good results. You know, when I was 23, I won quite a big tournament. And it was a shame, really, I didn't kick on from there and actually do something with that and start to play a lot more. And, you know, I could have got really good. But um, I didn't realize at the time, you know, this this doesn't last forever, basically. Right. Well, I think uh, every, every, most people, to some extent, feel that way about their, you know, younger years. I mean, yeah, totally. But I think the problem was, um, you know, I thought that would carry on forever. And I didn't realize that, in fact, with chess, a lot of it's a struggle, that you grind in a way and for, for peanuts a lot of the time. You know, the problem is if you're playing tournaments in England, uh, you know, most tournaments are like weekend tournaments. The first price might be £300, you know. So once you paid your – I mean, just just give you an example. There's a tournament next weekend in Payton in Devon. Now, for me to get the trade down there, which is probably my only way of getting there, I could get the coach, but that would take like forever. I mean, even the train takes about 10 hours or something ridiculous, uh, maybe eight hours, um, to get the train down there, it costs about 180 quid. Wow. The hotel would be about 300 minimum. So that's already, you already spent 480 pounds. Now it's a seven day tournament, I think. And the first prize is 400 quid. Yeah. So, so if I want to play it, so you do the maths. If I want to play at it, I'm not going to make any money, basically. And I'm guessing, I mean, it's a, it's not even close to being viable, but I'm guessing there's no conditions either for this. Is that right? Oh, no, there wouldn't be conditions for that. But obviously, there's certain tournaments, uh, there are conditions for 
but yeah, I mean, it's just very, very difficult to make money from just playing chess now, especially if you're, I mean, for example, uh, there's the Isle of Man tournament, which is coming up in October or like end of September, beginning of October. And uh, obviously you're going to get all the like top players in the world. Now, I think I played it that the first time I played it was about three or four years ago. And um, that was the first year they had it. And we got good conditions to play. We got like 900 quid to play. Actually, I think the first year we got 750. And I think the, the next year we got 900. Something like 900 to play. You know, which is really good conditions. But then you're still, you're, you're paying the hotel, which again is 500. You're paying the travel, which is which is about 150. And then you obviously you're spending money on food while you're there. Now, the chances are, unless I perform to like 2,600, if I perform to my normal rating, about 2,450, 2,500, I'm not going to win a prize. Right. So are there any class prizes? I mean, I don't know how if you've like examined the pay structure in that detail yet, but... Um, yeah, there are. There are, basically. I think the I think it's gone up slightly. It used to be 500, but it's now 750. But that's not a great prize. Right. So you're not going to make a great profit if... if even if you win that that rating prize, yeah, I mean, you know, and whether there is or not, your your broader point definitely is is crystal clear. I mean, it's you know, either way, it's not really going to amount to a living wage, and and or you know, and chess players are yeah. so good that it's uh it's a catch twenty two because if you're working, then how are you going to get better? Um, well, the thing is. I want to play these sort of tournaments because that's the kind of standard you measure yourself by when you play these top players. Um, are you going to improve as well? When you play better players who are significantly better than you, you're going to improve. Uh, but the problem is, like, for example, the Isle of Man now, I wouldn't get conditions. So I wouldn't get conditions now because they're putting all the money into paying the 2,700 players. Um, so I would have to pay for, for everything now. So I would already be like sort of 800, 900 quid out of pocket. Um, so I'm likely to make a loss unless I have an amazing tournament and I get like uh, one of the main prizes, which is high, seems highly unlikely. Uh, I'm going to be like massively out of pocket. Um, but at the same time, yeah, I need to play these sort of tournaments because – yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the problem is, yeah, you could, you could, uh, you could make the argument that um, basically, uh, you know, wh- wh- why should like lower rated GMs like myself get any money at all? Because we're not actually generating any money, right? You know, we're not, we're not making. It's not like football where they're actually generating TV money. We're not actually making any money, so, so we are dependent on the goodwill of others in in a way. Right. Or maybe the entry fees were dependent. I don't know what they're actually dependent on. Whereas the top players, you could argue maybe they generate a little bit more interest. So therefore, they do deserve uh, to get paid. Yeah. But it is going that it is going that way now, where the players on my sort of level get worse and worse conditions. And um, you know, I suppose you just have to deal with it, basically. Yeah. I mean, it's a there's a pretty clear corollary with sports i mean um since i'm in the u.s i'm more of a like baseball and basketball fan but so they have like minor leagues in those sports and they just pay the people playing peanuts basically um and obviously anyone who makes it to the top level uh is not being paid peanuts so um, yeah unfortunately it seems to be following that path Um, yeah yeah i mean i mean basically I, I suppose you could say, you know, um, yeah, if, if you're a 2,500 player, why should you make a living from chess? But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's just it's just depressing because, you know, I like to play chess, but I can't afford to play something like the Isle of Man. Yeah, and reading your book, I mean, uh, like everyone has, like, friends who, who uh, you know, things things in their life are not – like, they feel like things aren't right in their life. Like, they want something to be better. Um, and you mm-hmm. want to help them, but sometimes you know how to help and sometimes you don't know how to help. And uh, when I was reading your book, because you, you explicitly mentioned that you're not into teaching chess, like a, a lot of our guests uh, do some combination of broadcasting and teaching. And okay. even though yeah. I'm like a way weaker player, I, I teach chess and I'm lucky enough to like it. But you, yeah. But unfortunately, you just don't enjoy it, right? 
Well, it's funny you should say it because I was actually teaching some guy yesterday, and what we what we did go for a meal uh, before the, normally go for a meal before the game uh, because I don't normally eat that much, so I'm quite hungry. So it, uh, before we do the coaching session, so the coaching session normally lasts for about two hours, and uh, I was chatting to him and I said, look, you know, if I ever won the lottery, Richard, he's like a really nice guy, this guy, you know. He's like really enthusiastic as well. He's like, oh, yeah, I really enjoyed your sessions, Danny. It was really good. You know, whereas with most people, they're like, oh, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, um, you know, basically, I, I said to him, if I ever won the lottery, uh, the, the best thing about it would be, A, never to have to sign on again, i.e. claim unemployment benefits, and B, never to have to coach again. <laughs> And I suddenly realized, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that to the guy I'm supposed to be coaching about. (laughs) Right. Yeah, you have to, You, I mean, yeah, you have to care. I mean, in order for it to be, like, feel, like, redeeming at all. But, uh, I mean, I don't mind coaching him because he's he's enthusiastic and, uh, you know, he's quite a good player. Uh, So when a man, I think, you know, even if you're a stronger player, as long as you're not way stronger than somebody, you can still get something from it from the actual session even if they're you know because they're just giving you a different angle um uh, to to you know a different sort of viewpoint if you like but um yeah i think some people i think that's right i think some people have a passion for coaching but the problem is i've noticed that with a lot of people now is that they, they, they make such a comfortable living from uh doing commentary work or writing or so on that they actually stop playing altogether, which I think is ridiculous. Hmm. You know, because, you know, ultimately, why did you get into chess? You got into chess to play. You, you became a chess player to play. So you should at least make that your main focus. Now, you know, by all means, do the, do the stuff on the side. But the problem is, of course, you know, um, they, they have bills to play, to pay, sorry, they have rent to pay. And if they go away and play in a chess tournament, you know, they're still paying the rent or the mortgage for that week or two weeks that they're away. They're not going to make any money out of it. If they sit at home and, and do a DVD or write a book or do some coaching, then they're going to make money out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And some people, you know, as you get older, you think about having a family and that, you know, raises the stakes considerably. So, I, yeah. 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 I mean, so I definitely, I, I know where you're coming from, but I have some, you know, I have some sympathy for the people who don't play. I totally get it. I mean, it just takes so much out of you. Um, I mean, I think a lot of people, similar to what you said, a lot of the people you mentioned, if they, they probably feel like if they won the lottery, sure. But other than that, even if you're making a decent living, it, like you say, it's just, it's hard to, the opportunity cost is always there. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, in a way, it, in some sense, because I haven't got much money, it's kind of an advantage when you're playing because you kind of feel like, I kind of feel like if I did win a lottery, I'd probably stop playing chess, which is kind of a sad. So I was having this conversation with Mark Hebden, and he, I said, you know, if I won a lottery, you know, what, what would I do? I'd probably just go down, go down to bookies during the day and then <laughs> back to the club at night, you know, every, every day for the rest of my life, basically. What do you, like, you mentioned that a little bit, but what do you bet on, by the way? Well, I tend to bet a lot on. Uh, uh, well, actually, I had a lucky bet earlier. I bet on Liverpool to beat Arsenal. Okay, so mostly <laughs> mostly football. No, no. I mean, I mostly bet on uh, either horse racing or golf. Okay. But yeah, I do bet too much. I mean, I've got a bit of a gambling problem, basically. Uh, uh, but I think g- gambling is similar to chess. You know, I think when you play chess, you don't really have any financial security. So in a way, it's kind of a similar lifestyle to being a professional gambler. So it's not that much of a you know crossover. Yeah, it's very similar. I know I know a lot of. Have, I used to be a professional gambler, and I've known a lot of oh. them. And a lot of them, um, yeah, their life is a tightrope walk, basically. Uh, the yeah. I, I guess the difference if you're a professional gambler is the highs and lows. I think would be even more extreme because if people will lend you money, you can go into debt, and you know you can run it up. A little bit more, like run up your bankroll a little bit more than you can yeah. in chess. 
Well, but, I think as to, to be like a successful professional gambler, you probably got to keep a lid on it to the extent where the highs and lows aren't that extreme. Oh yeah, for sure to be successful, but it's definitely yeah. like an archetype in the gambling community. You know. Yeah, that. but it's like when you have a big win, you don't get too excited. And when you lose, you don't get too because if if you if you get too excited when you have a big win, then the downs are going to be yeah, you know. And it's probably similar to chess in a way. You know, you, you keep a level head when you when you get a good result. You know, like so during the tournament, uh, when you win, you know, don't get too excited because obviously then you've got a round the next day. So um, yeah, I mean, but yeah, I do think. Being a chess player and being a professional gambler is very, very similar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you talk a little bit. So you don't you, teaching is not your thing, and you talk a little bit in the book about how you, you know you just don't have any other skills. So there's like a running sort of subtext where yeah. you you at least give thought to quitting chess. So yeah. and I know this book came out about a year ago, and it took you a couple years to write it. So I was curious, like. Where are you now with that sort of running uh, internal monologue? Well, I mean, the problem is, I mean, I'm probably unemployable, you know. I mean, I mean I'll mean, just give you an example. I recently started, to, I was signing on, actually, because I ran out of money, so I didn't have any money. So I went, I went and, and started uh, claiming some benefits. Um, this is going back a few months because uh, my money situation is so bad. I didn't have any money coming in, you know, uh, nothing really whatsoever so I, w I went down and I, I claimed some benefit and when you actually obviously you expected to apply for jobs right. so when I was applying for jobs um, I just got no response whatsoever you know because you, you put on your, your application form that you're uh, uh, being like a chess player for the last 20 years to like what, what the hell <laughs> so what yeah. sort of uh, jobs did you apply for well, I mean, anything really. I mean, just like kitchen porter or, or um, I did think some of these jobs, you know, this is, I'm not going to, but it's almost like you're, because you're obliged to apply for them. Right, yeah. It's or, the same in the US, yeah. Yeah, but it's like, um, it, it made me realize how cut off from society I am, which in a way is kind of depressing, because it's like, if you don't want to carry on with a chest or you can't carry on with a chest, then what are the options? And you know, for me, the options aren't very good. So, um, yeah, sorry, yeah. Oh, I mean, I was just curious because I, I know that you say the options aren't very good and that you, you've had trouble coming up with something that you find yeah. palatable. Um, so if you were to rank, like, say, jobs you don't want, <laughs> like, out of, like, you know, chess teaching or, uh, you know, I know you enjoy writing and you make a little bit of money with that, but well, say that... Well, I probably enjoy writing even less than, than chess coaching, actually. Oh, okay. Wow. So, yeah, yeah, chess teaching, writing, and verse, like, say, you know, say you could work your way to a job as a bartender or something like that versus, yeah. like, uh, you know, some sort of manual labor. I don't know. I'm just spitballing. But you get the idea. Like, which one to you sounds like the least uh, soul-crushing? <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I mean, chess coaching, uh, say, I, I don't mind it so much. It's just difficult, like, where I live um, – I mean, I don't particularly like Skype coaching because it's just like it just that does feel a bit soul crushing because you, you you're kind of you know you're not even having any interaction with that person you you're just you're just talking to them over a computer right um, but actual coaching I mean there's not much coaching around where I live uh, so there's not much like when I lived in London there was more available but it's like schools coaching can be a bit difficult because you're 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 dealing with kids. And, you know, I've not had any proper teacher – I mean, both my parents were teachers, actually. But I, I never had any proper teacher training, so I just found it difficult dealing with kids. And, and then the parents always um, – you know, like, for example, when I, I coached this school in uh, in London, and it was uh, – what was it called again? It was in Kensington, South Kensington anyway. And I think it was the same school where Tony Blair sent his, uh, sent his kids. Wow. And, um, yeah, the first lesson I did, I got really angry with the kids because they were, like, running across running across the, uh, the, the classroom. And I said to one of the kids, I said, um, I said to the kids, I said, like, the next, the next kid to sort of get up or act out of line, it 
they they are going to kick them out for the chess club. And then, of course, two kids ran across the classroom. So I said, look, you know, I'm trying to be the hard man. So I said, look, you know, you're out of chess club. That's it. You're not, you're not coming back. You know, so obviously the other kids behaved then, right? right. And then uh, the next week, um, uh, basically the, the mother of one of the kids I threw out of the chess club, she turned up. She gave me a real dressing down. So it's like one of those moments where you just want the earth to sort of swallow you up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, yeah, I, I mean, I'm a teacher, so... I mean, the only thing I would say is you have to stand up for yourself in that situation. I mean, you know, yeah, she, she's not she's not there. You know, you you I, need, you're the one that has to be there every you know every week or every day yeah. or whatever it is. I do sort of think like with chess coaches, is it is there even a point to it? Because you know, I mean, I, you do think with a lot of people, it's just like a gravy train. It's like they can make money from it, so they exploit people who. You know, there's obviously a lot of people who have a lot of passion for it, but you know, I mean, I became a grandmaster. I never had like like a, like even like one hours one hour of chess coaching. You know, so I think the coaching can help, but you need to have the passion. The passion comes from yourself. You know, you, you can improve without without any input from someone else, basically. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe you can find a way to. I mean, if you were to do it, <laughs> to to motivate yourself, like with a you know some sort of goal to like marker, whether it be based on how the kids respond or based on the kids' strength or something like that. But anyway, I mean, you know, obviously, uh, uh, anyone who's read your book and read your writing, like, I get it. I mean, for sure, I've, yeah, I think we've all, to a lesser, greater or lesser extent, had had periods where we just feel like we don't know what to do. Well, I, I think the thing with chess coaches is I, I don't mind if they're passionate. Right. I do, part of the problem with this country, but why we're not really producing any good players anymore. You know, because if you look at the younger players in this country, they're not very good if you compare them to the players of the past. And I think part of the problem for that is the coach is just not very good. Um, you know, so, I mean, I'm, I'm there. But I've never been approached. I've never been approached by the English Chess Federation to say, look, you're a grandmaster. You know, we've read your staff. We know you're not doing much. Why don't you come and help our kids? You know, why don't you come and help them improve? Never approached me. Right. They sent them an email and they said, oh, this is the, what you got to go through. They didn't sound grateful about it at all. You know, and I thought, this is why we don't really have it. We're not producing any good juniors in this country because we're not, you know, we're not basically just the, the level of coaching is pretty poor. And I do think that I've, I'm probably quite a good coach, actually. I mean, the little coaching that I do, uh, isn't bad, but it's just like you know, I don't get the chance to show that. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a tough situation, and I get the impression from your book that I mean, I, it seems like you've had so you you mentioned a couple people who you say just don't like you. So do you think that that uh -huh. has to do with it? Like I know it's a small uh -huh. community there of chess players. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of. Like, yeah, you know, I mean, someone like Simon, he tends to get along well with a lot of people, but I tend to be quite regarded as a little bit aloof. I mean, I mean I'm mean, i okay, you know. I mean, I'm not an absolute Egypt, but, yeah, a lot of people seem to uh, don't like me because they regard me as this sort of, like, yob, yobbish character. Um, yeah, I think I get along with a lot of people, but, I mean, yeah. social media can be a bit of a problem as well, I think, because... Uh, you know, recent. I mean, I tend to sort of person. I fall out with people quite easily. Mm -hmm. Recently, I know. So I've been adding like there's like if, if you go on Facebook, there's like this whole community of chess players. So you just end, end up getting added by random chess players, basically. And so, like, accept these friend requests, and then I end up getting into arguments with them. <laughs> you know, and then I think, well, actually, the only thing I've actually gained from this relationship. Uh, is basically the fact that they're not going to buy my books and DVDs anymore because they think I'm a complete arsehole. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, but yeah, I, yeah, I do think there's a sense where I want you know it's, it's like an annoyance because I feel like you know I'm a nice guy. I feel like people should like me, but people have this image of me. And they don't give you a chance, basically. It's like there's a lot of websites uh, that won't give me work um, because they, they won't give you a chance, basically. Um, it's not easy. 
you know, you're competing. I mean, I'm, I'm in a way, I'm competing with someone like Simon, who's got a big YouTube following, and um, he's already got, a, you know, so site like chess based. I'll give him some radio work or whatever, or some commentary work because they'll think, you know, he's already got a massive following, uh, rather than giving it to someone else who who doesn't have that following, you know. Yeah. No, I get it. It's. Um I, you have my sympathy. I don't know. I wish I could, like, I wish I had more advice to give. One thing I would say is, like, the, the personal stuff that you write in your blog and, um, in your book, like, it really resonates. So I don't know if you do, like, any video logs where you just sort of, you know, lay it all out there. But I think that that's something that, that's not, not done as often as the instructional videos on YouTube and stuff like that. And well, I, think- I, 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 do, I do have like a YouTube channel, which, which I'm a bit lazy with. I haven't out- uploaded any material for a while, but I basically um, did a couple of videos on it. I think one of the videos I did was um, how Blitz Chess, online Blitz, destroyed my life. So I was talking about... Nice. Yeah. I, I mean, talking- I haven't seen it, but that, yeah, that sort of thing. That would resonate yeah. with people, I think. Anyway, yeah, go on. The most popular video because yeah. people were, oh, you know, what was this guy... So I was talking about how it, once you become really addicted to, um, you know, Blitz, it can basically take over your life and you just spend your whole waking hours playing Blitz all, all day. Right. Um, yeah, and I do think like with chess, I, I, I kind of, um, I'm not really comfortable with a lifestyle. I feel like you need a kind of purpose to your life. You know, you need a kind of like, uh, if you've got a job, then you kind of got a kind of structure to your life where you get up. You, it's difficult because obviously, you know, it's difficult because you're working every day. Um, but it's like when you're a chess player, it's like when you're like me and you're kind of quite lazy, then doing that, having that self-motivation is quite difficult. So I'm like, you know, I get up and then during the day I don't really see people, don't really, don't really socialize. I think it'd be difficult for anyone in that situation, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it's self-perpetuating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think the problem is I'm not sure how to break out of it. I'm not sure how to, you know, get a kind of job. Maybe I need to go back to university or some sort of college or something like that and then kind of get a kind of qualification for something where I can maybe break into Because I think, to be honest with you, being a chess player, it's like a dead end life. You know, being a 2460, 2470 chess player, like I am at the moment, uh, it's kind of like a dead end existence. I mean, you know, I'm going to be doing it until I'm 50, 55, 60, uh, with no, um, uh, with no pension. Yeah. I had the thought in reading your book that like you might, you might actually be better off if there were no prize money at all because the prize money is meager, but it's enough for, for you to think about and for you to chase. But like, yeah, but like if there were just nothing you know you would have to come up with another plan yeah i mean well yeah, absolutely i think like it's also the case like with the internet and tv and i think it, well, if i didn't have internet i probably would be literally forced to get out of the house because i'd be so bored right Do you know what i mean i think internet actually is another way of imprisoning people because it kind of imprisons them to sit at home all day you know talking rubbish on facebook and twitter where they could actually go out and socialize yeah so, yeah i think something like internet and tv is, is another kind of like a thing that's kind of chaining you to this to this kind of existence but um yeah with the um with the chess yeah i'm not really comfortable with a lifestyle and and i think a lot of chess players are very selfish people you know from my experience i don't really like chess players if i'm honest hmm um, <laughs> you know, I just find them very selfish and, you know, they're kind of, you have to be selfish because you're doing something where you're trying to crush the other person. You're trying to destroy the other person and you're trying to take their money basically. Right. You know, so, you know, even though I've got friends in chess, they're at the same time, there's, they're also rivals. Right. You're, you're still trying to beat them, you know? Yeah, yeah, and even if you're like teaching or doing videos, I mean, there's, you know, uh, a lot of people doing that as well. Um, yeah. All right, well, let's zoom let's zoom out a little bit because um, uh, cool. you talk a lot about sort of you know you tell a, a few stories about Magnus Carlson in the book, and you talk a, you talk a little about the sort of 
modern chess landscape of the top players in your book. And I was just curious, mm. like, if you have any updates. So you talked a lot about uh, Wei Yi, Chinese young talent. Um, who, yeah, who, yeah. Else, who else are you watching as like a, you know, up and comer or like, what do you think about the candidate cycle? What's your general, like, what's interesting you yeah. at the top level right now? Well, I think the thing with Magnus is he's obviously lost motivation because, you know, he is clearly the strongest player. I think everyone realizes that. I think the other players know that he's the best player, but he's lost motivation and uh, his results have clearly declined. Uh, I think Ponomaryov said it right, you know, uh, after the World Championships. The Carlson has stopped progressing his play. I think part of the problem is he plays his sort of like, his his approach is slightly negative. You know, he's played to avoid opening theory. And in, in a way, he could, you know, if, if people, if, he, if, 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 he, if he's getting a worse position out of the opening, he could look quite poor. But I still think he's the best player. Yeah, I don't regard the other players on the same level with him. Um, when he's at his best. But at the moment, he's not at his best. Now, I was chatting with Lawrence Trent, and he, he reckons that um, a lot of these people, they're not working as hard as they used to. So someone like Carawada, you know, he used to be like a real workhorse, but he's not working quite as hard. Um, so I think Wesley So, apparently Wesley So is one of the people who's working really hard. I think Wesley So is probably a good bet for the candidates. Mm-hmm. Now he okay. has to he has to get in still, right? Oh, does he have to get in? I thought he he would. He... It's yeah, it's pretty. It's trickier than you would think. I mean, so Karyakin's automatically in, and right. Grishuk and Mamadyarov are already qualified, and then the world. How did, that, how did they qualify? Uh, I'm gonna forget the tournament, but it was a tournament <laughs> earlier right. this year, uh, uh, where the Grand Prix. Yeah, so there's only eight candidates, and Grishuk and Mamad Yarov have two of the spots, and neither of them are top eight. So that makes it a crunch, and Karyakin gets another spot. So uh, that leaves four spots, I think, and two of them are from coming from the World Cup coming up. Right, right. And then there's one wild – I guess it's more than four because there's one wild card, and then yeah. there, after that there's the top two rated. So there's going to be some monsters that don't get in. It's it's going to be interesting. Yeah, MVL said he was um, he wasn't sure. He said he was very be very difficult to get through a rating. So he probably has to go through by the World Cup. Yeah. Um, obviously, you've got Aronian in there and Kramnik, who are very strong. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, those guys would be the favourites. I mean, you know, there's no obvious like player who's clearly the second best player. Um, they're all about the same level, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I do think that Carlson is the best. But I think I think that if somebody's going to beat him in the World Championship, I think it's most likely to be uh, somebody who just has like a really good run, like, you know, like Wesley So or Rodian, or um, maybe somebody younger. You know, I think if somebody's going to beat him, it's somebody younger, someone like Yi Wei, possibly. Mm-hmm. Is there any... Sorry, yeah. I was you just going to ask if there's... My fault. You go ahead. So you know with a Chinese guy, he's going to be working hard. Right. Yeah, you mentioned that in your book. <laughs> yeah. So you know, like, with these other guys, they might have this drop-off. Like, But if you're Chinese, you're not allowed to have this drop-off. Yeah. You so, know, so someone like Caruana might get a 2800 and think, mm, well, actually, I'm at this level now. I don't need to spend like eight to ten hours a day working on chess. I can drop it off a bit. But with Yi Wei, you know he's going to keep working at that level. You know he's going to keep improving. Whereas I think with someone like Giri, he seems to have stagnated. He doesn't seem to have really kicked on. And I think that's true of a lot of these guys now. They get to 20... I mean, you know, I can't imagine what it's like to play at that level, but they get to 2770, 2800, and then they, they, they falter. They drop back. Yeah, I can't, I can't imagine either. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty phenomenal level. I mean, I've played people like Adams... And he is a class act. When you analyze with him, I mean, he's very, very impressive how much he sees, you know. Uh, but he's also just very, very objective as well. I think that was the most impressive thing when I played Adams. Uh, he's very, very objective. And you think, well, he's actually good, like super good, but he's still slightly behind these guys. So that makes you realize how, how good they are. Um, I do think Carlson is a good bet, actually, to win the World Cup. Yeah. Yeah, he's so practical. He's, he's hard to beat, and I think 
he's got to have less pressure because he's already he's already uh, world champion. So these guys are trying to qualify. So to get through to the uh, to the last. Uh, I mean, I mean, it's more random earlier on because obviously you've only, I think you've only got two, two games at the start, and then it goes straight into rapids or whatever. Uh, so you could easily, you could easily draw two and then lose the rapid. But the thing with Carlson as well is he's very good at rapid anyway. So even if he sort of draw, even if he draws a couple of games, he's probably going to win the rapid. Yeah. So I think he's a good bet actually to win the whole thing. Uh, yeah. I love- I looked at his odds as about two to one. I think you know anyone anyone listening, get your mortgage on uh, on Magnus. That's then- not a that's not a great price though. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, I agree with you. He's that, cle- probably- clearly should be the favorite, but two to one, man, they make you pay. Yeah. So, Danny, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but our yeah, listeners, no. um, our listeners are always looking to. Uh, you know, in addition to like hearing about the chess landscape and hearing about your life, they're they're looking for some improvement advice. So, do you have any yeah. uh, book recommendations or general improvement advice uh, that you could well, apply broadly? Uh, yeah, yeah. The thing about books is uh, there's so many books now. Um, but yeah, I think general improvement. Yeah, when I when I filmed this video series recently, I said one of the things you should you should do. Is firstly you should you should check your variations. So I think that's very important. So when you're calculating, check your variations. You know, just keep going over what you've analysed, and I think you'd be surprised how much that helps you to improve. Uh, because you kind of blunder checking as well, because it's very easy when you first calculate a variation to just go straight through and get overconfident and then jump onto another variation. And, you know, that's what I found with my chest recently, that I'd stopped checking my variations, so I kept blundering. So recently I've started to check my variations, so I played a bit better. Um, I think the other thing is trust your instincts as well. You know, I think there's a lot of this, what I was saying at the start, I think there's a lot, uh, there's a lot to be said for intuition. You know, when you play chess, uh, when you play blitz chess, you know, the first move that you come into your head is often the best one. When you're playing in a long time control, it's much trickier, I think, than, than blitz chess. Because blitz chess, you play purely on intuition. Whereas you're playing longer time control, you've got to have that intuition. But you, uh, there's often cases where you can almost kind of overthink it. You know, so you, the first move you see, but then you kind of like steer yourself away from that. So I think you kind of you kind of yeah you you you've got to really have faith in your intuition i think and you know basically have a sort of like trust in your your instincts um but at the same time re- re- recognize that chess is a very deep game and you know don't be superficial yeah uh, trust it sounds inst- like it's the the advice is a little bit at odds because yeah, you have to trust your instincts, but also double check. It's superficial, yeah. So it's, it sounds contradictory, but obviously, the more you play, the more you understand when you know when you should trust your instincts and when you kind of, you know, one one of the things that inspired me recently actually was reading this Matthew Sadler blog because um, I think that helped me for the British Championships actually because just the level of detail he goes into with his analysis and it's really really impressive. The level of detail he he, he goes into, and um, you know, I think you need to kind of push yourself as a chess player. You need to that ability to go a little bit further in your analysis, rather than just you know, just regarding it on the surface sort of okay. thing. Yeah, cool. Well, that's helpful. And is there any book that like changed your path as a chess player? Is there any one standout recommendation, or not in your case? Uh, well, yeah, when I was younger, I mean, I mean, I had books like, uh, Bobby Fischer, my, uh, 60, was it my 60 best games? Most memorable. Yeah. Yeah. Most memorable games. Also, I had this book called, um, Chess for Tigers by Simon Webb. Yeah. I remember that one. Someone I mean, else he, wrote about it recently, but anyway, go on. He was sort of killed by his own son, actually, quite wow. tragic circumstances, uh, cause his, I think his son was suffering from schizophrenia. Uh, but Simon Webb was like a correspondence player 
and um, he he gave really good practical advice in that. You know, like where you, it's quite a funny book as well. He saw like quite good illustrations, and you know when you're you're kind of like a, um, you know, if you're playing against a heifer lump, they're very very strong and very powerful. But if you can lure them into uh, a swamp, they can get uh-huh. so uh, yeah. So like a heifer lump is like a really strong chess player. Okay. So, you know, like basically you try and make the position complicated. Yeah. David Smerden, who I know you've played a couple of times, gave that exact advice about playing stronger players. Yeah, yeah. You're more likely to beat them if the game is sharp. I mean, to be honest with you, um, I actually prefer complicated positions, you know. Like when they get the queens off, that's when I really struggle. But yeah. Uh, <laughs> No, it's true. It is true. You know, you, you, you take the um, – if you get a, like a bland position, uh, the stronger player will probably assert himself. But if you get – I mean, like, for example, earlier this year, I lost to a 2100 player, and he played H4 really early on. And then I was watching this uh, St. Louis uh, in, against the Groomfield. I think it's, it, you know, it's like on about move five or something like that. And I was watching this um, Gary Kasparov comeback. And in one blitz uh, game against Nepa Tomanchi, or one rapid play game, he played H4. And he got a really good position, actually. He ended up losing, I think. But, um, yeah, I thought maybe maybe, it was, maybe he's like reading, secretly reading my blog. You, know? <laughs> you never know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. So I think, um, yeah, I think the thing is you could get overwhelmed. With, there's so much material out there now. Yeah. You can get overwhelmed with it. Um, but I think it basically it comes down to yourself, how, however much you want him. I think one of the things you need to do as well is analyze your own games. I think now people are too dependent on computers. You know, I, I noticed, um, you know, probably like two or three years ago, Ben, uh, I was spending too much time uh, with computer engines and I'd, I'd lost the art of analysis you know, so I think what you need to do is analyze your own games and analyze them deeply. And then, you know, you can understand where you're going wrong, basically. Yeah. Yeah, it's so tempting to flip that engine on. Yeah, because it doesn't, it doesn't sort of like, uh, doesn't really, I mean, you know, if you get stuck on a position, you flick the engine on, it tells you what's going on, but that doesn't help your uh, ability to analyze. Right. I, I think one of the most, I think one of the best things about chess is you, you you're just looking at a position and you're trying to analyze and finally you hit on a like a like a, a an amazing idea. I think that an engine can complement your analysis to an incredible degree, but you've got to be very careful when you use it that it doesn't take over that analysis basically. Yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah. Yeah, that's good advice. All right, well Danny, uh, um I think um, I'm out of questions. I really appreciate your coming on. I think this was awesome. Sure, yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed it, mate. You know, any time you, uh, you need any betting advice for the World Cup, you know. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely be hitting you up. I mean, uh, by the way, shout out to uh, Chess Summit. They're doing a pool. So if anyone's interested, I, there's a couple of small prizes on the line. It's mostly just for, um, mostly just for show. But sure. I, and actually, I don't know if this will come out before this is released. But in any yeah. event, yeah, I mean, I, I like a lot of chess players, and this is like my favorite event. You know, the mm. the elimination tournaments are. are oh, are, actually, I agree with you. It's, this is one of my. It's probably my favorite tournament because it's like it's like real heads up stuff. Rather than the tournament itself, you kind of like there's a lot of games which don't really matter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, whereas in, in this, every game matters in theory. So it's 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 more interesting in that respect. I totally agree, yeah. Yeah, and it's like the tension will just mount and mount, um, which is, you know, yeah. what us yeah. sports fans like. So, yeah, well, Carlson, should... well, Carlson will win, I think. Right, but okay, the, 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 the tension for who qualifies for candidates then, yeah. <laughs> if nothing else. Yeah. Cool, well, thanks a lot, Danny. Yeah. Um, how should people, sure. uh, if people want to get in touch with you, how should they do that? Uh, don't. <laughs> Excellent, nice. Now, I've got a YouTube channel, which is called uh, The Retreat. So if they want to go on there and have a look at some of the videos, you know, feel free to leave comments as long as they're not too nasty. And try not uh, to en- enable your social media addiction. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. And sub- yeah, yeah, subscribe. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. yeah, and I'll link to the book as well. Um, yeah, sure. but 
But uh, thanks a lot, Danny. This was a lot of fun. Um, good luck. Well, I think I think people, will, a lot of people, will be rooting for you now. I hope. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> cheers, man. We'll take care. All right. Okay. I'll speak to you later. Yeah. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Perpetual Chess. To hear more episodes, give feedback, or suggest guests, go to perpetualchesspod.com. If you like the show, please help me out by telling your friends and giving me a high rating on iTunes. I'll be back next week with another episode of the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Thank you.